start in the middle of Cody's and leave him wondering what the heck was going on. So Cody's will just be missing from the recording um, and we'll, uh, we'll pick up from here. And Alexander, if you, anytime you are uh, ready, you can go ahead and get started and just let me know and I will advance the slides anytime you say next slide. Okay. Um, I also had a quick question about the um, evaluations. Are we just, do we have to like write it out as like a paragraph or can we just like use the te template to like answer the question? Yeah, just just write it out using okay. the template. Just answer those questions. Let me know right, that so, you followed okay. the presentation and you read the article, that's all. Okay. Um, all right, well, hey everyone. Uh, my name is Alexander um, and I'm just gonna be talking about um, a novel dental polymer that includes a flipped external ester group. Um, with the purpose to resist degradation in uh, dental prosthetics. So I chose this topic because um, I am pre-dental and teeth kind of fascinate me. So I'm that weird dude that likes looking in people's mouths. Um, we can go ahead and go on to the next slide. So um, I'm just gonna start off with a little introduction um, of what dental prosthetics are. Um, so as you can see on the left, we have uh, dental veneers, uh, which I will be discussing in a second. Um, we also have dental implants. Um, if you have like a tooth extracted, uh, dentists utilize a screw to kind of secure the prosthetic porcelain tooth to replace it so you don't have like missing teeth. Um, and on the right, we have um, dentures, which are like the old people teeth, um, which are a full set of, a, a set of fully like removable teeth. Um, go on to the next slide, please. All right, so for the purpose of um, my presentation today, I'm gonna be mostly focusing on veneers um, and the cement that um, holds them, holds the prosthetic veneer to the, the root of the virgin tooth. So uh, I'm gonna start by defining what a veneer is and how the procedure is completed. So a veneer is basically a porcelain mold that utilizes a resin-based polymer to act as a superficial covering um, for discolored or chipped teeth. Um, so the dentist will first drill away at all the compromised part of the tooth, which is like the stained portion or the chipped portion and create a surface that can adequately, adequately like secure the veneer. Um, the dentist will then use a blue etchant material, which you can see um, on the top there um, to kind of improve the bonding strength between the surface of the veneer and um, the, surface, the surface of your tooth's dentin. Um, and lastly, a cement will then be used to bond the veneer, which is what I'll be focusing on today, um, to the tooth. And this cement needs to be cured with the um, dental curing light, um, which is seen on the right there. And it emits a blue light with a wavelength of 450 to 490 nanometers. Um, these light waves produce free radicals that activate the catalyst that speeds up the polymerization and composite resin by creating a bond between the uncured monomers. So um, you know, we all have, you know, there's monomers and then when you cure it, they become polymers and they cement the material to produce a strong um, polymerized and bonded material. Um, so this is the cement material that I will be discussing with you guys today. Um, next slide, please. Um, so previously there were um, earlier dental methods that we don't really partake in today, which is on the left. Um, we have, um, they, com they compose of like vinyl resins and um, phenyl formaldehydes. So you can see on the left there, there's phenyl formaldehydes. Um, and as you can tell from the diagram, I kind of circled it there. Um, the monomers um, or the polymers were only held together by a carbon to carbon single covalent bonds. So that resulted in a deficiency in the stability strength and they were prone to like degradation and lacked abrasion resistance. So, you know, like, if you were biting down an apple or something, it wouldn't hold very strong. It would just, um, it was easily breakable. Um, so then we started developing, you know, as um, technology advanced um, and we understood these concepts better, um, we developed um, methacrylate monomers, which you can see um, on the top there. Um, these uh, methacrylate monomers, um, which are the uncured bonding agents um, were discovered as a drastic upgrade from the um, phenyl formaldehydes um, because they were able to, um, they increase the durability of it. So an example is ethylene glycol dimethacrylate, which is, um, as you can see on the bottom, it's the left um, EGDMA. So this is what we're currently using right now as um, dental cement. Um, 
it's sub uh, substantially improved the dimensional stability strength and water absorption and also the photopolymerization of the material so basically what that means is it was it was able to retain um you know like wetness like liquid better and it was able to um not really come apart on impact when it came to like biting down on surfaces and stuff like that but there was also an issue with this methacrylate um it was found that the longevity of it was compromised um it so basically it would be able to take a uh, direct impact but it wouldn't last for too long so the longevity of a prosthetic would um would be in um would be compromised in this case so as you can see from the diagram on the bottom there um over time the polymer backbone which is where the red arrow is pointing at of the um, ethylene glycol dimethacrylate um it would it would become hydrolyzed and the bonding resin no longer holds so as this hydrolysis happens, the ethylene glycol is a byproduct that in sufficient amounts um, is toxic actually to the body. Um, it can affect our central nervous system, heart and kidneys. So if you see on the right there, it says ethylene glycol as a byproduct. So the backbone between the two um, EGDMA monomers, um, because of the um, because of our saliva, there's different enzymes and bacteria cultures in our saliva that um, end up over time hydrolyzing that um, that backbone right there um, and causes it to split up and break from polymers to monomers. And then what you see there on the right is the two monomers being separated and ethylene glycol um, becoming a byproduct. So as I was saying, it um, ethylene glycol was found to be um, toxic to our body in significant amounts. So over time, it will affect our bodies. Um, next slide, please. So this study, um, uh, it was a study from ACS. Um, six scientists found a way to relatively maintain the durability of the ethylene glycol dimethacrylate while improving upon the longevity um, by combating the hydrolysis of the ester bonds. So if you can see from the EGDMA, um, internally you'll see two esters, uh, ester functional groups um, that make up that polymer backbone. And that's what's at stake here in terms of longevity. Um, so actually, while they were doing that, they were also able to find, um, a, I guess, a solution to the um, ethylene glycol byproduct issue as well. Um, so this magical solution is called ethylene glycol ethylmethacrylate, or EGMA. Um, so it's very similar to EGDMA. The only difference is a flipped um, ester group. So in instead of the ester groups being internal, they're external. So if you can see on the top there, that's the EGDMA, and on the bottom, it's the EGEMA. So they're very similar in structure, but you'll see that um, the ester groups are flipped externally, and the backbone no longer consists of um, the ester groups. Um, so since the hydrolyzation of the polymer backbone by the enzymes in our mouths affect um, polymerized ester groups, by flipping the esters externally, scientists predicted that the hydrolyzation would no longer break the polymers into monomers, leading to longevity of the retention of dental prosthetic cement. Um, next slide, please. So the experiment performed consisted of EGDMA as the control monomer while EGEMA, which is the novel um, monomer was being tested. Um, so camphor quinone, dimethyl amino benzoate and diphenyl, uh, diphenyl iodium hexafluorophosphate um, were all added as, um, they were all added as photo um, initiators to assist in light curing. So the process where monomers, after they're being light cured, bond to become polymers. So the experimental setup consisted of like, if you can see on the right there, the diagram, um, a glass slide, um, a PTFE mold of the monomers, which was um, what we're testing, another glass slide and a white PTFE sheet, um, and a silicone base to prevent the polymer um, mixture leakage. So all the, the um, 
the test disks were separated adequately. Um, so all the experimental disks were um, prepared at 1,000 milliwatts per centimeter squared using the LED curing light for 40 seconds. Um, we can go on to the next slide, please. So the hydrolytic stability or the ability to withstand the hydrolyzation was studied using accelerated aging model. So this is basically what we're focusing on is um, how long this cement will last between the EG DMA and the EG EMA comparison. So both polymer disks of the EG DMA and the EG EMA were stored at a one milliliter sodium biphosphate uh, buffer at a pH of 7.4. So this is important because it's um, also the resting pH of the saliva that we have in our mouths. Um, and both disks were also stored at 37 degrees Celsius, which is um, the temperature of our oral um, environment. So our mouths like temperature on a day to day um, and also 55 degrees Celsius. So that was um, to show the accelerated aging model. So this is shown because 15 weeks at 55 degrees uh, Celsius is equivalent to a year in 37 degrees Celsius. So within 15 weeks of the study, we are able to see kind of like an estimate of what it looks like after a year. Um, next slide, please. So the scientists measured the strength of these polymers by finding the hardness or uh, diametral strength, uh, tensile strength and the total energy needed to fracture. So as you can see from the diagrams um, on the right B and C, um, overall the tensile strength and total energy needed was, um, the total energy needed to fracture was significantly higher in the EGEMA samples. So um, if you see on the left um, graph A, both of these factors were combined um, to come up with, you know, like a, a summarized um, like coherent graph of um, comparing the EG EMA and the EG DMA. So you can see that um, the EG DMA disc would fracture um, at a certain level of strain. So you see like around uh, 0 0.025, um, all of them would fracture and just like the, uh, the hydrolysis would um, combine with the stress would end up just breaking the um, cement apart. Whereas if you look at the EG EMA, um, it can, it endures a little more stress and is able to, um, over time, because this one's, um, this one shows the aging model as well. So over time, it's still able to hold together and um, retain that stress. Um, next slide, please. So um, basically what we did here was we're able to show that by flipping, you know, the esters externally, um, we were able to retain and retain kind of the, the strength of the EGDMA, but also improve upon the longevity of its, um, like longevity of its ability to stay um, bonded to the tooth. So we're basically um, saying that it's a, it's a stronger, it's a stronger, um, it's a stronger component. And as well, we were able to get rid of the ethylene glycol as a byproduct. And um, we're basically killing two birds with one stone. So as you can see here um, the, on the bottom, when the EG EMA um, is hydrolyzed, so hydrolysis still occurs, but because um, the ester groups are external, it doesn't affect the backbone, which is what holds the uh, monomers together. So when this hydrolysis occurs, you can see that ethanol is a byproduct. Um, next slide, please. So we all know that ethanol is not harmful in trace amounts because we all drink beer and hard liquor in, in higher amounts, you know. By the way, I'm not promoting binge drinking. I'm just saying, you know, beer and hard liquor is much more enjoyable than ethylene glycol, you know, because of your, your dental prosthetic, you know. Um, it's not fun. Um, so as a conclusion, you, um, you can see um, through the graphs and studies that the scientists did that we are improving upon two different aspects of um, the issues that we had. Uh, we can go on to the next slide, please. So like I said, two crucial issues work um, with current dental prosthetics cement products were drastically improved upon by simply flipping the ester groups from internal to external. Um, 
So to me, I found this really fascinating because I'm interested in dentistry, but you know, either because I mean, I feel like organic chemistry may be one of like the most difficult subjects that I've studied in, in college for sure. But it um, honestly really is um, sorcery to me because in this, in this instant, it's just like you think of an issue that you have and two issues in this um, instance and you literally just flip an ester group externally and you solve two problems that are like major issues with, um, within the dental field. So even though it's hard props to organic chemistry, it's definitely something that makes our lives better. So that's it for today. Thanks guys. All right, excellent work, Alexander. Um, we'll open it up to questions um, for a minute while I, and then I'll check to see who's presenting next. Anybody have any questions? Oh, no worries, Emily. <laughs> hey, do you know if there's much variation in um, saliva pH among people? Um, yeah, that's definitely a thing. Um, it, you know, obviously what we consume in our bodies will affect like what we eat on a day to day basis will affect the pH of our saliva um, in terms in, as well as like all other parts of our body. Um, so this study was kind of just like a median study. So it was kind of just taking an average of everyone's pHs and, you know, um, utilizing that to test out this um, cement. But yeah, those are there's a lot of different factors in terms of um, our pH and our saliva. I have a question for you, Alexander. Yeah. I was just wondering if you knew which part of the dental cement polymer was the part that broke off and turned into the, what was it, ethylene glycol? Ethylene glycol. Yeah. Um, so if you go back to um, the previous, uh, go back a little bit more, a little bit more. Okay. So, um, if I'm answering your question correctly, so if you see the um, the veneer right there, it's that little, um, it's a porcelain prosthetic that's placed upon like um, a prepared tooth. So basically what they'll do is they'll drill down your tooth from what it was to like um, a stronger base where it's just the root. And then we're putting on a cap to be able to fit that. So everything fits like in line. Um, the, the part that's actually um, producing the ethylene glycol is the cement that's used to hold that prosthetic to the tooth. So over time, um, you know, our saliva will get, you know, into the crevices and, and start affecting the cement that's holding that there. So once that starts hydrolyzing the, the polymer backbone, that bride product is produced and it's, you know, mixed into your saliva and you consume it. So that's the toxic part of it. That's interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, it's trace amounts. So I'm not saying like right now, if you get like, you know, um, you know, dental prosthetics that you're going to die, but like, you know, it's a very small amount. So over time, it could have minor effects, but, you know, it's just a lot better to just put alcohol in our system, right? <laughs> so it's, it's a good <laughs> yeah, thing. I was thinking in terms of the chemical structure. So maybe there's like two carbons in between the ester and then each end of the two carbons that oxygen turns into an alcohol or something like that? In terms of the uh, EGMA, like the new um, cement that they're looking at? Yeah, I, I didn't was, look yeah. I didn't look too much into that, but I'm assuming that's what occurs. Um, they didn't really focus upon that. They were testing more, um, you know, the, the, the numbers to see how durable it was over time. Um, but I would be assuming that um, if you can see on the bottom there, it shows the byproduct. Um, so if you look at um, the polymer there, you'll see, you know, the oxygen from the ester bonded to a carbon to another carbon and then the oxygen of the other monomer. So when, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. Um, when hydrolysis occurs, um, I guess that would chop off the oxygen there and then it would um, become protonated. So it would produce um, the two oxygens on the side and then, or the alcohols on the side. And then it would have um, the, uh, the two CH2s in the middle. So that would be, that would make up the ethylene glycol. Um, so that's what we don't want. And then, so yeah, if you flip the exactly esters to the outside. Asking. Yeah. So they, they switched the ester groups from right. being like this yeah. to like this. Uh, yeah, okay. so, so initially the esters were internal 
and then they flipped them yeah right there to the outside so as you can see there um if you cut that off the um you can see the byproduct right there is uh is um, ETOH. So you have alcohol instead of the, um, the ester groups there. That's an interesting paper and definitely pertinent to everyday life. I got a crown I need to get replaced in July. Yeah, yeah that's why, I mean, I, I find it fascinating because I, I'm in um, the dental field, but um, you know, I just thought it's amazing how like literally just by flipping an ester group can solve so many issues. It's, it's kind of crazy to me. All right. Well, excellent work, Alexander. And I agree that is a really cool one. Um, just uh, shows illustrates how how unreactive ethers are compared to esters, right? Sean, I had a question. I don't know if it's running short on time. I think we have time. We had a blank spot there. What's up, Adam? All right. Well, no, it's actually for uh, Alexander. I just wasn't sure. So this is basically a glue. It's not really meant for crowns or bridges or anything, right? Um, so there's different, uh, you know, there's, um, cements that you use for, um, you know, prosthetics, there's different prosthetics. So like when you have veneers, you do use a different cement than you use for crowns. So the one that I'm talking about right now is, um, more specific for veneers because, um, when you have a crown, for example, and you use cement, it, it doesn't utilize the light cure. So it's basically just, um, an air dried cement. So it doesn't, it doesn't really pertain to this study. Um, when you have veneer specifically, though, um, you use a cement that you use to light cure, and that's where you come up with this monomer to polymer um, backbone. So it's it's you use different materials for each um, thing you do. So you don't have to worry about crowns or bridges. This is more for veneers. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, I actually used to work as a dental tech, so I know. Oh, really? Okay, but, cool. Um, that's why. Yeah, I was just curious because I this until the very end when uh, I think it was John asked. No, actually, it was Cody that yeah asked which part of it degraded i thought you were actually talking about polymers to you know make crowns and the veneers and all that stuff i didn't realize oh you mean like the porcelain stuff. to actually you know yeah, the, yeah exactly the porcelain yeah no <laughs> yeah that part's that part's pretty stable that's a different story <laughs> yeah yeah there, there's a lot of things going on here but yeah yeah, yeah, cool. yeah yeah thanks yeah no worries all right great work and we'll go ahead and uh, turn this one off. And I believe, John, you're up next. And then on deck is on deck is Elky. Um, so if you want to get ready to, do you want to drive or do you want me to drive, John? I can drive. I'll, I'll, I'll give it a shot. All right. If you have any issues, we can switch over. Okay, um, thank you. And take it away whenever you're ready. Sorry, this might take me a second. Uh, no rush, no problem. Maybe you can help me, Sean. Should I yeah. put this screen share on my other screen and then like uh, hit present and then go to share screen on Zoom? So that's that's the way that I usually do it is I had I start my slideshow and then I hit yeah. hit um and I hit share screen and then it usually will let you pick which screen you want to share. So whichever one your presentation is on, it share yeah. that screen. Okay. Um Are you guys seeing that? Yeah, you're looking good. We yeah. just see the presentation. Okay, okay cool. Um, all right, I uh, went with this paper um, done through a group at the University of Chicago, um, mostly because it had to do with uh, retrosynthetic analysis. And uh, it's definitely, I don't know about you guys, but um, this felt like the hardest part um, of the class for me. Um, I also felt like it was a little grounding to kind of look at the, the current state of synthesis and 
innovations that are happening because I feel like it like that part of OCHEM really bridges um, theoretical knowledge and the mechanisms to uh, just real life making you know valuable valuable things like medicines and polymers. Um, I liked your your conclusion, Alex. Um, I thought it was a good segue. Um, so we'll just get into it. Um, the the discovery um, is this new re reagent um, that they found: um, benzyl oxy, uh, povol, um, pov alloyl oxy trimethyl fluoral benzamide. Um, we can just call it 1C or anomeric amide 1C. Um, they synthesized this this molecule. Um, and it was quite simple to synthesize, just they were able to do it in three steps. And they found that when you react this reagent with secondary amines, um, that's a molecule with a nitrogen bonded to two, two carbons and one hydrogen, um, it essentially just deletes, it appears to delete that nitrogen out of the molecule. Um, in a pretty easy way. You just reacted in THF uh, with heat. Um, it doesn't require any toxic reagents or anything like that. It, it seems to be quite simple. So um, here's, here's a secondary amine um, reacted with the anomeric amide and it just seems to cut that nitrogen out. Um, this is one example that they highlight uh, in the paper um, Pemetrexed, which is a, a chemotherapeutic agent um, that they were able to synthesize pretty easily. Um, but we'll we'll get back to this one. Um, this is a, this is a good example to go back to later because you see multiple nitrogen atoms um, in the functional groups that the reagent doesn't mess with. Um, it just cuts out the nitrogen in the middle there. Um, it's Put this discovery in a context. Um, I don't think it's quite often that this type of uh, method is discovered. Um, the paper notes that the ability to insert or delete single atoms um, is very attractive uh, from the point of retrosynthetic simplicity. Um, while there's some classic reactions that allow you to do this, um, I think the main one covered in our class was the Bayer Billiger oxidation. Um, seems to kind of magically cut that oxygen um, in a really simple way. Um, other outside of these, like um, such a simple kind of powerful um, method seems to be somewhat few and far between. Um, the paper uh, kind of stresses that um, many of the innovations in synthesis are um, have to do with peripheral editing and not so much skeletal editing. Um, I think even when we were, um, you guys probably remember when we were doing retrosynthetic analysis in class, kind of Sean emphasizes that, you know, there's only so many methods available to edit the skeletal structure. Um, and in some ways I feel like this, this just kind of speaks to um, the nature of progress in science, kind of what Cody was getting at with discovering new molecules. Um, you find something that might work and you just kind of make small stepwise changes to try to optimize. Um, the lab, um, Mark Levin's lab at Chicago um, was founded to actually attempt single atom skeletal editing, um, but not necessarily, they weren't necessarily, like they didn't set off trying to delete nitrogens. Um, I think the, the inspiration for that came from a paper that's a couple decades old from Australia um, uh, by a researcher named Stephen Glover. And he's actually the one who uh, comes up with this term, anomeric um, amide. Um, if you guys have taken biochem or might've been taught in your bio class that um, an anomeric carbon um, is, it comes from um, structures and carbohydrates. So that would be the carbon um, in the cyclic form of a sugar um, that's connected uh, to the carbonyl group in the straight chain version. 
Um, just a little more context. Um, I found this, this article on Chemistry World. Um, and this is a, a wish list kind of put together by a survey of uh, synthetic chemists um, talking about you know, what, what innovations in synthesis would be helpful. And uh, as you can see, making and modifying heterocycles. Um, heterocycles are just cyclic structures um, that have elements that, um, more than one element. So things um, that aren't carbon, nitrogen, uh, sulfur, oxygen. Um, so to get into their experiments and, and the process, um, they actually started with a simpler version of the reagent. Um, this is our reagent 1C. They started with this one, uh, we'll just call it 1A. Um, they reacted, they synthesized this, and then they reacted it with um, like a model substrate, um, 2A. Here's your secondary amide. Um, and they got a decent result. Um, they got a 35% yield of this nitrogen deleted product, um, but they also got a significant amount of this, this side product, um, this acetamide molecule. Um, so to deal with that, they synthesized 1B. Um, um, it's, it includes this pivotal oxyl group, um, which is typically a protecting group used in organic synthesis. And they ran the experiment under identical conditions and ended up not getting any of the side product. Um, and the yield of this product of 3A was increased to 57%. Um, and then they further refined it and eventually discovered that the para trifluoromethyl substituted reagent or reagent 1C um, reacted more rapidly than, than 1B. Um, it led to a complete conversion um, within five hours as opposed to 18 hours that was required for, for 1B. Um, and again, I'll mention that I think a cool feature of, of this reagent is that it's, it's quite simple to synthesize from commercially available uh, reagents. Um, it yields 78% over three steps. And I think it mostly involves adding things together. I think there's two isolations involved. Um, this is the, the mechanistic hypothesis. Um, it includes a bimolecular nucleophilic substitution um, and then a reductive elimination um, to get this isodiazine intermediate, which seems to be highly reactive. Um, the nitrogen, both nitrogens, one from the, the amine and one from the anomeric amide are kicked out um, as nitrogen gas, um, which I imagine drives the, the reaction forward. Um, after you lose the, the N2, um, you get these carbon radicals that combine um, essentially your two carbons combine to form that bond in the middle. Um, so it appears as your, your nitrogen is just uh, deleted. Um, I thought it was a pretty cool kind of unprecedented um, molecular rearrangement. Um, they, they went on to um, do some more experiments with reagent 1C. Um, they looked at what kind of functional groups uh, this, this reaction would tolerate um, and what kind of structural diversity you could have. Um, so look at functional groups. They evaluated a series of dibenzyl amines, um, all of these structures. Um, all of these structures have some medicinally relevant functionality. Um, and if you look at the yields, um, it shows that the functional group tolerance of this method is is quite high. You know, it works for a lot of different functional groups that are that are relevant. Um, it it's it's also notable considering um, the highly reactive intermediates um, and the mechanism. Um, also, it it kind of shows um, that this reaction is pretty chemoselective, um, which means that it's only going to um, affect a certain part of the molecule. And this is that um, chemotherapeutic uh, said that I 
showed an image of earlier, um, note all the nitrogens in the functional groups that aren't affected. Um, this was just put together, this whole thing was put together by essentially combined by building this half and building this half, putting it together with a nitrogen in the middle and deleting the nitrogen. Um, they also discovered that you can use the technique for ring contractions that give access to new molecular skeletons. Um, you can start with these cyclic molecules um, in your initial ring synthesis, these molecules that have nitrogen atoms, and then just delete the nitrogen. Um, so as etidines to cyclopropanes, pyrrolidines to cyclobutanes, azepans to cyclohexanes, and you get the idea. Um, it shows that even in like a built molecule like this, um, uh, you see this, um, looks like a pyrrolidine. Um, they just delete the nitrogen out of, and you get the cyclobutane. Um, a big practical advantage to uh, the synthetic strategy is that it mitigates the costs and safety problems associated with um, some of these other methods to make carbon-carbon bonds um, that just require expensive or toxic reagents. Um, they also show that you can use this method to delete nitrogen from commercially established drugs and natural products, um, um, kind of like Cody was talking about, um, to generate new biologically active or functional compounds. Um, I think one, one example that they, they highlighted in the paper um, was this this tyrosine kinase inhibitor, which is also a anti-cancer drug, I believe, um, lepatinib. And they just kind of stress that without this method, you would essentially have to build this molecule all over again, almost from the very beginning. Um, and you can imagine that, you know, if your work involves drug optimization um, and you're just wondering, you know, if it, a certain drug would, work better with the carbon atom on one side without a nitrogen. Um, you can use this method and just snip out the nitrogen and not have to build a completely new molecule. Um, as you might expect, there were some limitations. Um, the main one um, that they talk about is that reaction yields were typically higher when the starting molecule had features that stabilize the reactive intermediates. Um, they, they talk about um, the importance of the, the phenyl groups. Um, outside, as, outside of that, they ID kind of four major categories um, that are limitations to this reaction. Um, oxidatively sensitive substrates. Um, the anomeric amide can function as an oxidant. So certain classes of substrates are oxidized faster than they undergo nitrogen deletion. Um, there are substrates that were uh, precluded from reactivity by steric hindrance. Um, there were substrates uh, for which the isodiazine intermediate um, uh, rearranged to a hydrozone and that outcompeted nitrogen deletion. And then there were substrates um, that fragmented as opposed to um, forming, reforming that, or forming that, that carbon to carbon bond. Um, nonetheless, I think the, the scope, um, the present scope of this method um, is pretty broad um, to suggest that, you know, it could very well be widely adopted um, and I'm sure there'll be improvements to, to the method as well. Um, so yeah, the team, uh, Levin's team is actually working with Sigma Aldrich um, to scale, scale up synthesis of the react, reagent. And um, so I think pretty soon it could be broadly available. And um, I read that in the meantime, he's happy to send free samples. Um, so Sean, if you wanna get to deleting some nitrogens uh, in the new LTCC lab. Um, I'm sure you can get your hands on some of this stuff. Um, otherwise, you can also synthesis, uh, synthesize it from scratch. It, it seems straightforward. 
Um, and that's the end of my show. Thank you very much, John. That was great. Yeah. Um, and actually, um, I got really curious in the middle of your presentation. So I actually went and looked at the original article and found to look at the metrics, which so that in the world of, of academic publishing, um, your metrics, how many times your articles have been cited, how many people are talking about your articles is one of the primary ways that they um, decide whether or not you've earned tenure or not as a professor or whether or not your publications are good. Um, and this paper is in the, the top 1% of all papers of a similar age. Granted, it's pretty, it's pretty new. It hasn't been cited by very many people because it's too new to have been cited yet. Um, but there's a lot of scientists are talking about this paper. Um, so this is a great one to pick. It might, it's definitely going to have some implications for organic synthesis down the road. So I wanted to um, tell you good job for picking uh, a very good paper on that, on that front. Thank you. I noticed that he's an assistant professor and um, he was blowing it up on Twitter, you know, when he got published on nature. So I'm sure he's on his way to tenure. He's, and he's, he's a very young, young dude too. Yeah. Um, looks like a young guy. So that when you get to be an assistant professor and you're, and you're this, this age, um, that tells you you're doing something right in the research world. Um, so your, and also conversely, it could be that you're doing something very, very wrong in your personal life because it uh, typically requires a lot of uh, sacrifices to do that. But um, anyway, does anybody have any questions for John? I do. Um, you never really kind of went back to the nitrogen selection because there it didn't it didn't get rid of all the nitrogens, and I was curious about that. Um, to be honest, Adam, I felt like that part of the paper was a little beyond my pay grade. Like that and the mechan and the mechanisms involved. Um, yeah, like I wanted to kind of present the mechanism portion a little bit better. Um, like maybe how you did Cody, I thought that was awesome. Um, but like even reading that, you know, synthetic chem, like synthetic chemists, professional chemists would have told you that this was impossible about a year ago. <laughs> I kind of thought, um, um, you know, we'll leave that, leave that one off. Um, Sean, maybe you can elucidate a little bit. Yeah, me. Okay, I'm un unmuted. Um, I thought that. Uh... So I'm trying to find the, the exact figure where I started thinking this, but I think it has something to do with whether or not the nitrogen's lone pair is conjugated with pi bonds. Mm -hmm. um, because it looked like most of the examples that you were showing where it worked, you had an sp3 carbon on either side. And so no lone yeah. pairs, no conjugation there. And most of the ones where it was left alone, the nitrogen was either part of a aromatic structure or at least had had pi bonds conjugated with it. So um, I would guess it has to do with that, but uh, they'll probably, so now that this has been done synthetically, this translates into um, theoretical work. And now a whole bunch of computational chemists are going to be all over this for the next five years, trying to explain exactly where it works and where it doesn't and why. Um, and doing, you can do a lot of that with calculations because we can do things like look at the orbitals and things like that. Um, so yeah, overall great work. Um, Elke, if you want to uh, go ahead and, and start getting prepped here, does anybody have any, any last questions for John? I was gonna squeeze one in if I could. Yeah. I was just wondering maybe uh, if the reason that they're saying that the nitrogen is deleted is because it's being released as gas and it's just getting eliminated from the molecule type of thing, but that's just speculation. I don't know if they specifically said that in there or not. No, that, that sounds about spot, spot on to me. No. A really interesting, John. Cool, cool paper choice, man. I like it. Yeah. Thanks, man. I'm sure maybe you'll be looking at it in the future and deleting Hopefully nitrogen. Using it in the future, yeah. Yeah, that's what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Elke, do you want to, do you want to present um, or do you want me to drive? Um, I can present. Let me let me get it up. Okay. And in the meantime, John, one last round of applause. Excellent work. 
and we will keep on trucking. We're making good time. Since I know you are not as well practiced screen sharing as I am, so let me know if you need any help with that um, on the technical side. Okay. Yeah, I was, I was like, I'm just trying to get it up first, and then I was gonna like share the screen that it's presenting on. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> but you know what? Maybe, maybe you should just do it because mine's not going for some reason. My connection's really poor. All right, let me see if I can get that pulled up then. And uh, we can do that. And just like with with Alexander's presentation, just let me know when you want me to uh, advance the slides or go back, whatever, whatever you need. OK, thank you. Hey, Sean, you just want a, um, a slide deck, right, for the assignment on Canvas? Yes. Yeah, so just just submit your slide deck so that I have the ability to to do this and or um, I also I also save these as well, so I can I can use um, uh, good examples in the future for uh, for future classes. Um, although I will also check with you before I just or redact all of your identifying information before I, I use your work without telling you. Um, so. Um, yeah, please just submit it as a, if a PDF is fine too, if you don't need me to present it, but if you might need me to present it like this, then a PowerPoint slide deck is perfect. <clears throat> and Elke, you are good to go whenever you're ready. Okay, so my uh, research article was based around um, the effects of BPA on these two genes, um, it's ICAM1 and HLA genes um, and their expression as well as the DNA methylation profiles um, in cumulus cells of infertile women um, that have poor response to ovarian stimulation. So um, things like IVF, um, women that have a hard time getting pregnant. Okay, um, next slide. Um, so in my presentation, I'm gonna go through um, a bit of an introduction purpose of the study, some background information since my paper was a lot of um, biochem, um, and then briefly some of the methods they used for the experiment, results, discussion, and then a conclusion. Uh, next slide. So um, bisphenol A um, also, usually known as BPA, um, is one of the most mass produced chemicals in the world. Um, we find it in polycarbonate plastics and you also find it in epoxy resins. <clears throat> um, and like I said, it's the most produced chemical. It's also extremely ubiquitous. Um, the average amount in humans is about 51.99 nanograms per milliliter. Um, and the FDA says that around 1,000 um, nanograms per milliliter is the safe limit. Um, but we, going into this uh, research, I mean, it doesn't really matter how much BPA is in your body. Um, it can affect, you know, your hormones and your um, gene expression. So um, I thought that was, you know, some propaganda over there for you. You can see, I mean. They, you know, it's all political with the FDA. So anyway, um, so BPA, um, it breaks down into metabolites. Um, and um, so when they're looking at the amount of BPA in someone's body, usually they look at it through um, urine or blood, um, you know, because it breaks down, it, the number isn't totally accurate. So there could be actually much more BPA in your body, then you, then we can actually even test for. Um, <clears throat> and so, how do we obtain BPA in our body? Um, so, any type of you know plastic utensil, plastic water bottle, um, even you know things like uh, chew toys for, or like you know the chew rings for you know baby babies that are teething, um, can just break down and. Um, 
yeah, into your body through that. So, I mean, usually the higher chance, like if you put, you know, hot water into your plastic um, bottle then, or, you know, something that's acidic or alkaline, it's gonna break down that BPA faster. Um, and then it attaches to your food or drink and enters your body. Um, and, but that's not to say that even if you're not like eating hot food or hot like liquids um, with plastic that, you know, you're still gonna get BPA, it doesn't really matter, but it's higher percent, the more hot it is. So anyway, um, next slide. Um, so I just wanted to talk about the genes that they looked at in this um, study. They looked at the um, ICAM-1, which is, um, it's an intracellular adhesion molecule. It's a transmembrane um, protein, glycoprotein, um, and it plays a role in ovulation in the process. Um, <clears throat> uh, like OCI uh, maturations, spermatogenesis, so that's, you know, just the maturing of your um, little baby egg and um, also the process of, um, you know, producing sperm um, in the male testes. Um, so um, in addition to that though, I, well, so it is a biochemical marker. So um, when they're looking to do the IVF process, they are looking for the ICAM-1 gene, um, but it also, um, has a role in um, afferent and efferent immune responses. So anything that requires intracellular contact and collaboration. So that's like, you know, your T helper response, um, B cell response, <clears throat> antigen induced T cell proliferation, um, just anything really with the immune system. So um, let's see. And then, so the HLA gene, uh, G gene is, um, it's a human um, leukocyte antigen gene um, and it plays a role, it also plays a role in the oocyte maturation and inflammation of embryos. Um, and then also the expression of the spermatogenic cells, um, pre-inflammation embryos, pretty much everything to do with, um, you know, the role of ovulation and, um, you know, making sperm, like all these genes play um, a very pivotal role. So that's why they studied, they looked at these genes specifically um, and their um, expression. So, um, and, um, oh yeah, and then also the cumulus cells specifically, um, they looked at these genes within those cells um, because they, the quality of um, the cumulus cells, so that's, you know, when they're doing IVF, um, directly relate to these, the translation of these genes. So anyway, um, yes, next slide. Okay, so this was the main purpose of this study um, in so many words. This is a little quote. Um, so they wanted to look at the relationship between the follicular fluid BPA concentration. So in this um, study, they went, you know, they took samples from um, inside the uterus to measure those specific BPA concentrations. Um, and then they also looked at the protein level and methylation status of the ICAM-1 genes and the HLAG genes um, in the cumulus cells. Um, and so um, just to see, and then um, in the study, they looked at you know, people, um, women with poor ovarian response, and they had two groups, I'll get into this, but they had, you know, a, like a healthy lifestyle habit group and an unhealthy lifestyle group. And so, um, so they compared those two groups. Um, but so the, let's see, um, so the methylation status, um, is just you know denoting the um, addition of a methyl group onto the substrate, so onto these specific genes, um, and then um, yeah, um, methylation like can be good and can be bad. In the case of this study, um, methylation was more of like a um, like a poor a representative of a poor translation of these genes. Um, so anyway, um, and then just to talk about the poor ovarian response, um, it's women with um, 
a poor response to gonadotropin stimulation. Um, so that's just a hormone that they um, give women when they're going through the IVF process to kind of um, encourage um, ovulation and um, healthy um, inflammation of embryos. Um, and um, still um, women with poor ovarian response is kind of, um, there's still a lot of unknowns with that. And part of the purpose of this study was to see how much of a role BPA um, plays in women that have a hard time getting pregnant. Um, anyway, um, next slide, please. Okay, so some more background. Um, like I said, this study was really heavy in biochem, so um, just some stuff. I thought we'd talk about um, BPA is an endocrine disruptor. So um, it acts on a hormonal level by distorting hormonal imbalance or balance and um, specifically BPA um, induces estrogenic effects because um, it binds with estrogen related receptors. Um, and um, estrogen is, or I'm um, sorry, BPA is very similar to estradiol, um, which is one of the main hormones um, it, within the reproductive um, process. Um, and um, estradiol's main role is um, within uh, maturing and maintaining the reproductive system. So helping to mature eggs. Um, uh, and it specifically, um, it also helps with releasing of the egg. So um, just, you know, if BPA is going in there and attaching to a nuclear receptor, um, then it's going to, uh, you know, estradiol isn't going to be able to come in and um, act on that receptor and instead BPA is. So um, it could be affecting those receptors. Um, and let's see. Um, <clears throat> and so, and nuclear receptors, um, they are just a class, um, just a receptor that, that respond to, um, hormones. So just if, in case you didn't know that, um, and then, um, the molecular, uh, molecular mecha uh, mechanism of BPA in the human body, like I said, is still pretty undiscovered. We don't really know the ex like exactly what's going on. It does have something to do with the receptors. Um, little OCHEM, um, the binding of BPA to those receptors um, is you know, direct hydrogen bonds and um, hydrophobic interactions. So um, they're kind of um, kind of strong, but not as strong as the actual hormone, which um, is a whole nother topic that they didn't really get into. Um, so, and yeah, like I said, BPA acts on the receptors and mimics um, estradiol um, and um, it keeps it within its active conformations, um, which should be on the next slide, please. Uh, actually it's not, well, this is something else, but we can, yeah, we'll talk about this. Um, this is just, I just wanted to show, um, so this is our polycarbonate um, polymer, what we is what plastic is made out of. And then we have um, we have the breakdown of it. This is very simplified. Um, but like I said, with you know alkaline or acidic um, or heat, we'll break it down and it will leach into your food and water. And then and then you know, obviously you could, you know, it's a cycle, you could make it back into polycarbonate, but that's probably not gonna happen. Um, and then I just wanted to also show this, the estradiol down here, although it doesn't look like I'm looking at it and I'm like, it doesn't really look that similar. It, within the receptor, it, it acts, it can bond and attach um, in the same way that estradiol does. So um, next slide, please. Okay, so this is what I was talking about. Um, this was more background research that I actually did, um, wasn't in my specific um, study, but I thought it was kind of interesting. Um, so, so basically BPA um, is stably binding here and interacting with um, an active nuclear receptor. Um, and so it keeps it active um, and that's, a um so 
it binds and then it actually keeps the site activated. Um, and this um, facilitates the binding of co-activators. Um, and, and then this receptor is actually trapped within in an active conformation, um, which then um, the, co the binding of co-activators um, has a downstream effect of um, gene transcription and signaling. signaling. So it, it um, makes it plausible for that, um, for a BPA to bind and then affect um, how gene transcription um, goes on. So, um, Anyway, um, yeah, that was just a little blurb. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so um, so these are some of the experimental methods. Um, pretty generalized. Um, there was they did a group of eighty women, and I believe they started out with more women, but um, depending on the IVF um, process is very intense, and so I know they lost a lot of um, patients just because it's, it's a lot on um, a female's body. Um, and they picked these women that had poor ovarian response. They had to be under 25 or 35 years old and they had to have a BMI between 18 and 25. So they had to be relatively like healthy. Um, so, and they split them up into two groups. Um, so two groups of 40. Um, so like I said previously, one group um, was women with a healthy lifestyle. I denoted that with WH um, and the other was women without a healthy lifestyle and that's WOH. So the women with a healthy lifestyle had um, reduced use of plastics within um, their daily life. Um, and then um, the women without a healthy lifestyle had a lot of plastic use. So, you know, like microwavable plastic, you know, frozen meals and you know, um, drinking out of, you know, like plastic water bottles that have been sitting in your car in the heat and that kind of stuff. Um, and then, um, so this kind of goes into more of the IVF um, method, which um, is pretty generic, but um, patients, they receive daily subcutaneous injections of recombinant follicle stimulating hormone. And that's just to start, you know, stimulating, you know, your ovulation process. Um, and um, that dose of that injection, you know, depended on um, their hormone levels and, um, you know, monitoring where they are in their cycle and whatnot. Um, they also receive the subcutaneous injections of the gonadotrophin or the GnRH antagonist. Um, and that was when the follicles, so um, within your ovaries, they reached a growing stage of about 12 milliliters or more, or milli, yeah, millimeters, sorry. Um, and <clears throat> when they got at least three follicles at 18 millimeters or larger, then they received um, an intramuscular injection. Um, to release the, the eggs. Um, so, and then during that study or when, um, like immediately prior to that, they did um, a follicle puncture. So that's where they, when they took the sample of the, um, the follicular um, and they did the um, cumulus oocyte complexes. So those are the eggs um, in addition to some, um, like some extra cells around the eggs. Um, and then, so the cumulus cells, um, they, they had to um, denude them, denote them from metaphase two gametes. So they just had to kind of pull apart the, um, the gametes from those cumulus cells. Um, and they used, um, so they didn't actually use IVF. They used this thing called ICSI. It's um, intracytoplasmic sperm injection. IVF generally is just, you know, putting, you know, your egg on a, um, you know, like in a, in a dish, in a Petri dish, and then letting the sperm kind of fertilize the egg. The um, intracytoplasmic sperm injection is literally taking a sperm and an egg and injecting the sperm into the egg. So that, you know, it happens. <laughs> so it's a bit more direct, but I think also a bit more um, elaborate, probably maybe a bit more expensive, but maybe better results. Um, uh, oh, and they chose um, the fertilized embryos. They chose them based on quality. So, and then that's for transfer into, um, you know, the wall of the um, uterus. 
So, I mean, embryos are just graded on like quality, how well that they're dividing, um, just kind of, you know, just normal, normal, um, normal egg stuff. Anyway, all right, um, you go next slide, please. Um, and then, so some more methods. Um, so they um, analyzed the ICAM-1 and the HLAG genes um, and their protein expressions using quantitative PCR and Western blotting technique. Um, so, let's see, um, so, and they, they also took into account the changes in ICAM-1 and HLAG levels um, and they used, they, they compared those, the changes um, in those genes against a beta actin um, as like a housekeeping protein. So just um, comparing how beta actin, um, like how it um, translates and then yeah, seeing if it's normal compared to um, ICAM-1 and HLAG genes. Um, and then um, they also take into the account the, um, the infertility um, and um, like, or, oh, that was against the healthy, unhealthy lifestyle habit group. So um, <clears throat> just um, using like the, the least well um, translating gene group, group pool, I should say. Um, okay, and then the methylation pattern they used, um, they researched it by using a methylation specific PCR. Um, they had to use specific primer pairs for methylated and unmethylated promoter sequences. Um, so they just had to have, you know, basically two primers just so that they could um, actually identify which one was methylated and which one was unmethylated. Um, and um, they got those from human placental um, genomic DNA um, as a positive control. So to compare to um, how accurate their um, PCR results were. And then they tested the total BPA. So that's the conjugated and free um, BPA in the follicular fluid using high performance liquid chromatography technique. Um, and they had a detection limit of 1.14 nanograms per milliliter. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so their results. Um, they noticed um, there were a significantly higher amount of um, oocytes in the healthy lifestyle group. So yeah, women that produce less or um, come in contact with less plastic produce you know, more oocytes. So um, I think that was kind of within their hypothesis too. And then the metaphase two gammy oocyte um, retrieved was higher actually in the unhealthy lifestyle group, um, which was interesting. Um, and then as expected, the clinical pregnancy rate was higher in the healthy lifestyle group. So um, women that avoided plastic had an easier time getting pregnant. Um, then they also noticed the ICAM-1 and HLA gene protein expression um, in women without a healthy lifestyle decreased 13 times compared to the healthy lifestyle group. So um, women without a healthy lifestyle group, um, their protein expression in those genes specifically um, was a lot worse than the healthy lifestyle group. So they didn't, um, they didn't see as much of that. Um, and then um, the, the average methylation index of ICAM-1 and HLAG in chemo cells was higher in the healthy lifestyle group. Um, I think that's a typo. I think it was, um, well, we'll look, we'll look at the data. We'll look at the raw data. Um, and then the BPA levels in the follicular fluid were as expected lower um, in the healthy lifestyle group. So, and then I hear women without a healthy lifestyle group had 4.73 nanograms per milliliter versus women with a healthy lifestyle group had around 1.56 nanograms per milliliter. Those are averages. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Okay, um, so here we go. So um, yes, that was a typo. So we can let the relative um, <laughs> methylation gene um, 
women without a healthy lifestyle had higher methylation than the women with a healthy lifestyle. Um, so their genes had a, um, you know, their DNA was methylated, um, which just leads to bad transcription. Um, and then um, you can also see the protein expression was better in women with a healthy lifestyle. And um, also the gene expression was um, significantly higher in women with a healthy lifestyle group. So um, that's um, some data. And I think we the next slide, if you can click to it. Oh, it's, Oh, okay. I submitted this to you on a Google Doc. Yeah, I guess you can click on the link. Um, and I edited it. <laughs> and I guess it didn't um, change when I... Okay, so yeah, here we go. Um, this is just more raw data, but um, it, you know, it kind of breaks down more of what we saw. Um, and um, it gives you a good average of everything. I mean, I find it interesting the oocyte quality. So women without a healthy lifestyle, it's like 2.5 versus with healthy lifestyles, 3.5. So, you know, an entire, um, you know, point higher on, um, you know, I mean, and of course this is, this is an embryologist grading these. So it's kind of relative, but not really. Um, and then, um, we saw um, the clinical pregnancies, actually, they weren't that different, I think, when they averaged out. Um, but I, I think the healthy lifestyle group did have that easier time um, getting pregnant. Um, and then we talked about the BPA level and the follicular fluid. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, look at the ICAM-1 gene and the HLA gene. I mean, like over here with healthy women, we have 14 versus one in the unhealthy lifestyle group. Anyway, it's just um, crazy the differences. And these are women that like generally besides, you know, their lifestyle habit, um, you know, like I said, like the B BMI and everything, like, you know, they're on the same playing field. They're just, you know, doing different things with how they, you know, with their day-to-day -day activities. So I think that's really interesting. Um, anyway, yeah, if you can go back to the, uh, yes. And then the next slide. Um, and so, yeah, this is just the, um, some, a discussion, um, basically, I mean, just to go more, just to talk about it a little bit more, um, you know, polycarbonate. Yeah, this is definitely my old PowerPoint. <laughs> oh, well, um, let me, hold on. Um, I'm good my, so, um, yeah, polycarbonate breaks down and attaches to food and enters the body um, and it affects the body. It affects um, your, the transcription, your, the protein profiles and the methylation status in your body and those cumulus cells specifically for this study. Um, like we said, BPA acts like sex hormones. It disrupts the endocrine system. It, um, it disrupts hormone signaling pathways. Um, and because of this, it interferes in the reproductive gene expression, um, function of your ovary, your uterus, and other reproductive organs. I mean, they didn't look at men specifically, but like I said, this affects um, how sperm develop. Um, you know, it can so it affects your ovulation, your oocyte maturation, and the clinical pregnancy rate. Although in that data, we didn't really see uh, much of a difference. Um, and then, yeah, so. Um, the reduction of ICAM-1 and um, HLAG was one was the major contributor to the oocyte maturity disorder um, and infertility in um, the women with an unhealthy lifestyle group, um, and as well as um, the hypermethylation of DNA um, also caused the um, the lack of maturity um, in the unhealthy group. Um, and so, yeah, like I said, lifestyle habit plays a vital role in regulating um, the ovarian response, oocyte maturation, and reproductive process and gene expression. Um, and, um, and so because of that, lifestyle habit is an essential marker for oocyte maturation. Um, and um, in addition, it's also um, a, a key player in the ICAM-1 and HLA gene expression. Um, and quality of their sites. Okay, and then conclusions. <laughs> uh, 
Um, yeah, so um, yeah, to reiterate, uh, alterations of the ICAM-1 and HLA genes are directly related to BPA concentrations in women with poor ovarian response. Um, yeah, to get more into it, yeah, nutrition and lifestyle, they affect everything. They affect how your genes function, um, how your DNA is methylated, the expression profile of your proteins, um, and then also your protein level and cumulus cells. So um, it, all, it all matters. And it is an essential marker for ovulation and oocyte maturation process. So if you're trying to get pregnant, avoid plastic. Um, yeah, and then I think I just have work cited and that's it. Excellent work. Give her Elke a round of applause. Um, does anybody have any questions for her? <clears throat> Yeah, I think you already covered it, but I think I missed it. Um, what was the receptor that they were using an agonist for? Um, they were so they were looking at um, the the yeah. If you could go back to that, um, it's it's basically um, it's just for those specific genes, the ICAM one and the HLA G genes. Um, basically just trying to see how BPA um, bonds to those receptors that um, like they would normally be working against. And this, so like I said, this is from a totally different article, but I felt so awful because my paper had zero to no OCHEM in it. And again, this is kind of more biochem, um, but this is a, this is the second um, research paper on my work cited. Um, but I just wanted this whole, the process of this was just for me to show you how BPA acts on those, or, you know, nuclear receptors and why it, you know, why it, how it does affect gene transcription. So it's just basically the fact that it can hold it into an active position um, instead of turning, you know, the gene off once it's been, um, once it's been, um, bonded with, but, you know, I definitely need to take biochem before I you know, start splurring off, you know, unreal knowledge. Anyway. Yeah, I think it's a really Sorry. interesting topic that you chose. I think, you know, it's kind of like mercury and fish or something like that, something that you're, you know, for the most part, totally unaware of, but it has a pretty big impact on your health or reproductive health. I heard something um, about phthalates I think it's spelled with a PH and I think it has similar properties where it disrupts your endocrine system and it causes problems with reproductive health in both men and women. And I think it comes from plastic also. So there's probably a lot more stuff like this that, you know, we should be aware of. Interesting paper. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, no, I know. Um, I was also looking into some research about um, like perfumes. I'm not sure like specifically what the compounds are in perfumes, but like if you're putting on perfumey lotion or like just, you know, like actual spray on perfume um, that's, you know, like synthesized, it's not like, you know, naturally occurring like essential oils or anything. It, it is also an endocrine disruptor. So there's a lot of things out there. You, yeah, if you wanna have kids, you need to be really careful with what you put in your body. And also worth noting, just because I can't let uh, let the naturalistic fallacy go, um, that there are also lots of things that are naturally occurring that can also interfere with these processes as well. Um, so it has more to do with the quality of what you're doing, and did they do a good job purifying it if it was if it was made synthetically? And sometimes it's the molecule itself that can interfere, but then also sometimes it's just the nature of that particular shape of that compound that can get in the way of some of these as well. Um, John, did you have a question yeah. too? Yeah, kind of on that note, I was wondering if, I guess I'm just thinking out loud, if, if BPA can affect transcription of genes that um, where the effect might be seen as positive, you know, certain genes that you do want to turn off. Um, Yeah, I, I didn't look into that. Um, I think, well, I'm a bit, probably a bit biased. So I did look at the research that was maybe more against BPA, but I know that, I mean, 
I don't know if there is any positives to BPA because I know it's, you know, they were trying to like outlaw it for a while. Um, but I mean, there are other compounds that would, I don't know, I'm sure Sean, you know, the compounds they use now that are just like BPA, but they're slightly different. But because there's been no research on them, they're still allowing um, like plastics um, to be produced with those. And they also still affect, um, you know, they're also endocrine disruptors, but there's just no research yet, so. Yeah, in general, the um, so two two points. One is that yes, there's definitely other plastics they're using now that that might still have an effect, and actually polyphthalates that Cody brought up um, are one of those, um, and they're actually still in the polycarbonate family of polymers, so they would be definitely applicable to this this study. But again, because they haven't been studied as much, they don't give off um, BPA exactly. They give off something similar. Um, but then also just in general, and uh, Emily's presentation is going to talk about this um, later as well, um, methylation of your DNA in general is how your body regulates which genes get expressed and which genes don't. So whether or not, and so that's, that's a very fine line, methylation of some genes is a good thing and other genes is a bad thing. And that's kind of controlled by your, your genetics and your um, and your cells, and anytime you mess with that, there can be long-term effects, um, regardless of whether you're methylating things that are, suppo that are supposed to be demethylated or demethylating things that are supposed to be methylated, you can cause some issues with that. Um, so definitely those are, those are related topics, and there's a lot of research going into that. It's epigenetics, which is the study of which genes get expressed, is a huge field right now. Um, because we know how to how to sequence things, but we don't know how that actually gets expressed in cells as well. Um, all right, and at this point, we are a little bit or behind schedule, and I realized also I did not give us any time for a break. Um, so I'm I'm going to call an audible, give us a five minute break before Hava starts presenting. Um, let's say at uh, 2.55, and we'll see if we can make up time, and maybe we might just be able to do whatever the few presentations are we don't get to today. We might do them at the beginning of the review session on Thursday. Um, so just keep that at the back of your mind if you're still waiting to present, although we do still have a whole nother hour. So let's take a five-minute break. Everybody get up, walk around, um, get some air, some water, and uh, we'll resume with Hava's um, presentation at 2.55.
All right, Hava, as everybody's getting back, if you want to get ready to present. Absolutely. Um, okay, and uh, are you going to screen share or do you want me to drive? Uh, I'm going to screen share, at least want to try. Okay, if it doesn't uh, work, then just either email, send it to me an email, or um, if it's a Google Doc or something, you can throw it in the chat and I can get to it that way. Okay, perfect. Um, sorry, I have a new laptop, so I'm trying to figure out how to allow this. Okay, so I'm going to have to um, restart my Zoom so I can share it. So just give me a brief, brief moment. All right, no problem. Go for it. Okay, let's see if I fix this problem. Looks like it. Okay. So, can everyone hear me? Perfect. Okay. So, I'm going to be presenting today on the concise and efficient uh, synthesis uh, for the preparation of high purity six pramidol or peridol. Um, it's also known just as a peridol. The main goals of this presentation is to explain what peridol is, its importance to us as humans, the failures of older synthesis or syntheses of peridol, and lastly, breaking down the most recent published attempt to using four reactions to create a high purity compound with a pretty decent size yield. Um, peridol is a common aromatic key ketone found within the family of ginger, which has 1,600 different plants. It is more concentrated in Aframomin melagueta, uh, also known as grains of paradise. They are found throughout the swamps of west, the western coast of Africa. Grains of paradise are seeds considered to be a type of pepper. These seeds are closely related to cardamom. It is described as African pepper because of their peppery taste and the little kick of heat they produce that is more like peppercorns. Besides being used in uh, West African cuisine, um, it's also used in medicine. Uh, it's as well has been commonly found to be used from the Middle Ages and onwards as a flavoring agent for beer and later in liquors, namely gin, due to its pungent aromatic flavor. Oddly enough, the seed was banned in both England and in Florida in the 1800s, citing using the seed adulterated the flavor and causing deception of the consumer to believe that the alcohol tasted stronger in its alcohol content than it actually was. An interesting fact stemming from the prior ban, England did overturn the ruling, however, Florida did not. Many gin companies use grains of paradise as one of the main ingredients to give its gin its expected flavor that we know. Uh, besides using juniper berries. This actually caused a Florida man to bring on a class action lawsuit against the parent company of Bombay Sapphire because of the adulteration law that still exists in Florida. The law suit was eventually thrown out as it was considered the law was antiquated and goes against the federal law that proven ingredients that have been deemed to be safe for human consumption may be used as an ingredient in food and beverage items. Besides in gin, grain, grains of paradise are used by home brewers and commercial brewers alike to add robust flavor to their beers. The most notable would be Sam Adams Summer Ale. Another common plant paradol is found in is ginger, another spicy peppery ingredient, but turns sweet after it's been cooked. Ginger is commonly found throughout Asia, the Asian continent and a main ingredient in many Asian dishes and traditional Eastern medicine. Unlike its cousin grains of paradise, ginger is considered to have health benefits, even though both ginger and grains of paradise contain peridol, shogol, and gingerol. All these ingredients all have been studied to actually have health benefits. Ginger can be found over the counter as a supplement that is pr promoted as anti-nausea and anti-inflammatory. It is noted that peridol is um, metabolite to shogol 
after it goes through an enzymatic reduction once a sugar is metabolized. When ginger is dehydrated, many gingerols have been dehydrated um, products that become sugarols, which then create the product of peridol after metabolization. Uh, with the history of uses down, let's look at the actual health benefits of the peridol molecule. This is not to be confused with the prescribed medication that goes by the same name, peridol. This medication is a pain reliever for moderate to severe pain that is made of a combination of two painkillers, tramadol and paracetamol. Um, both molecules have um, completely different structure to shovenol, gingerol, and peridol, as shown on the side comparatively. As mentioned, parts of the ginger plants have been used for traditional med uh, medical properties. A lot of research has been done over the years of researching the actual uh, health benefits of the compounds, both individually and combined as a whole as it would be when we would consume it. But were there actual what were the actual findings of the research? Uh, in an article by Wan Wu Chang et al. in the article um, anti um, antioxidative and anti-tumor promoting effects of pyramidal and its homologs. They researched the anti-cancer properties of um, peridol and its homologs using mice. They, um, using mice, it discover, they discovered it to inhibit a few things related to skin cancer as well as in vitro. One of their observations showed they, um, they inhibited DMBA and TPA. These are substance, substances um, that initiate skin cancers. They also noticed in vitro that the oxidation of DNA bases, one of the motivations that can cause cancer was inhibited, thus indicating that peridol and its homologs may actually have anti-cancer properties. Another example is on the study of the improvement of memory by peridol done by Kaho Yamaguchi et al. In the article, six um, peridol and its glucoside improved memory disorder in mice from the Journal of Food and Function. The study was fascinating as it actually discovered that with the treatment with um, peridol, dendritic cells elongated by 5.4 to 8.7% from its original length. It was used in combination with a nerve growth factor. Without peridol, the dendritic cells did elongate uh, with the nerve factor growth or the nerve growth factor on its own but not nearly as much as it was when it was paired with peridol. <coughs> Since the dendri dendritic cells grew, the connections of the brain improved, allowing for improvement of memory in the mice. This could be a start of looking into combination therapy to help those affected with memory disorders for us humans. The last example that I will go over for proven health benefits would be for diabetics. In the study conducted by Chen Ke Hey and colleagues, um, diabetes, diabetes is the most common endocrine disorder, which causes a lot of compounding health issues if not properly controlled by treatment and is a leading cause of death worldwide. In their study, in their study they've, uh, that was published in the International Journal of Molecular Sciences showed that glucose was utilized more in mice with a, on a high fat diet while adding ginger to their diet thus reducing blood glucose levels. With this information, it supports the guidance of some endocrinologists recommending ginger supplements in combination of other therapies to help reduce uh, glucose level, blood glucose levels. Having established what peridol is and it's important to us, let's dive into the synthesis of the compound. Previous, previous methods had many problems and very low yields. All the syntheses, excluding the most recent one, started with um, vanillin, which is a phenolic aldehyde responsible for the vanilla flavor we know. It's readily available commercially. The first synthesis with vanillin by Xi et al. was only three steps. These steps included acetone in sodium hydroxide 
and dihydrogen with the catalyst um, palladium, on, palladium on carbon. This synthesis produced a measly 13% of peridol. The next synthesis by Gal et al. was done in seven steps with only a 19% yield of peridol. It was also seen to have used um, dihydrogen palla with palladium on carbon and acetone with sodium hydroxide in water, um, as well as dihydrogen uh, with palladium in methanol. The largest bump in yield was actually with Troy and colleagues with 50% um, yield compared to the previous syntheses of 13 and 19% respectively. This synthesis had two reactions from vinylin. The first reaction used a Klensen-Schmidt condensation, which is a reaction in which a ketone or an aldehyde with an alpha hydrogen reacts with an aromatic compound when it does, doesn't have any alpha hydrogens. The next step was protonating the, the double um, bond in the carbon chain with dihydrogen and palladium on carbon in methanol. methanol. This sounds great, but to synthesize on a large scale would be difficult as they needed to be, use a column chromatography to purify the compound. Um, column chromatography uses polarity and hydrophobic, um, hydrophobic siccity to separate the compounds. Then the layers are dripped, poured into containers, separating the layer with the product that is desired. Um, with Hori et al, they had the highest yield of Peridol at 65%, but it was very expensive because one of the catalysts was extremely expensive. But the other issue that they had was one of the intermediate compounds was not commercially available. As explained, each previous synthesis had um, either produced low yields, had difficult purification processes, or expensive in using things not readily available. Now let's look at the most recent synthesis. Shang Shi et al.'s biggest breakthrough was using a retro synthetic analysis of peridol. From this viewpoint, they were able to see that the N monoxy and the M methyl acid acetamide portion of the prior compound was very important to the last step to form peridol. A difficulty the researchers came across was the byproduct that was hard to get rid of during crystallization to purify the sample, possibly due to the poor selectivity of the ketone carbonyl and the double, high, the double bond. Since it was more difficult to reduce um, compound 16 by hydrogen on the, um, to the carbonyl group on the amide structure, they decided to use um, palladium on carbon as a catalyst for dehydrogen um, on compound 16 to produce a high yield of compound 20. Um, the most important last step was a Grenard reaction with one magnesia methyl bromoheptane in TH and toluene, removing the methy and methyl acetamide, acetamide uh, replacing it with a heptane. At this point, they purified the product and dried it with anhydrous sodium sulfate. They then filtered it to produce an oil that was recrystallized. And within the crystallization product, um, they were able to separate um, the byproduct and the original pro or the product, the, um, the targeted compound as they were completely different substances. One was a dry white substance and the other one was a waxy white stuff substance. Um, and from there, um, with this process, they were able to achieve a purity of 99.2% with an overall yield of 72, which is higher than the other one which had the, the second highest uh, yield that had issues with not having the right, like the right intermediate wasn't of commercially available and a catalyst was too expensive. Um, so while 
So while using just commercially available reagents with only four steps uh, in their synthesis, after many trials and errors that they had, they were able to produce something that was actually pretty good. And my citations. Any questions? Excellent work. All right, any, any questions at this point? I had a quick one. Um, so you mentioned that the next best, um, next best synthesis used stuff that was not commercially available or that was expensive. Um, what were they actually starting from in this case? Were they still starting from vanillin and just going through a different pathway or using something else? So they actually started with a compound that was similar to vanillin, but they were using a byproduct from, or a um, intermediate. Uh, let me go back. Oh, okay. So I, my, uh, I'm sorry about this. I didn't have the scheme that the, for one of them, but essentially they use this one. I have no idea what it's called. Um, so they synthesize this and um, then end up using the dihydrogen um, lodium on carbon. Very cool, thank so you. It was from a prior experiment that they had, which started from a compound that's similar to venolin, but it's missing a hydrogen um, one of the aspects, and I forget what that, that specific compound was called. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions for Hava? Right. Then I will go ahead and let's let, uh, let's see who's up next. Um, Adam, uh, Hava, excellent work. Um, very good synthesis paper. Those are always fun to find, especially when they involve natural, making natural products from um, synthetic means. Um, because believe it or not, that's, that's a case where it's actually probably more environmentally friendly to, um, to synthesize it in a lab rather than grow all of the grains of paradise necessary to make an industrial supply of, of Peridol. Um, so it, uh, it's definitely interesting. And also an interesting historical note, I looked it up while, um, while you were talking because I couldn't help myself. Um, but uh, grains of paradise is, are also associated with, um, with voodoo rituals and with some Western um, African um, rich, uh, religious and, and uh, cultural rituals. Um, and so it's likely that that actually was more of a played more of a role um, in getting it banned from Florida and the UK it was likely a response to um, West African and Caribbean um, religious practices and outlawing those rather than actually having anything to do with the gin itself, um, which I thought was a, a, an interesting cultural note because there really is no and the fact that Florida still has that law on the books when there's absolutely no reason why. Um, why they should. Um, so very, very interesting on a cultural note as well, I thought. Um, all right, Adam, if you want to get yourself ready to go. Yep. Um, and then uh, do you want me to present or are you going to present? No, I got it, I think. Okay. If you have any issues, just let me know. We'll do All right, we good? You guys see that? Yeah, we see it. We're looking at it. All right. I chose an article uh, called Organocalcium Mediated Nucleophilic uh, Alkylation of Benzene because, I mean, half of this quarter we dealt with benzene and trying to add things to it. And I thought this was a, a great article and a great mechanism, which, you know, it has a lot of potential. Um, so, yeah, so. 
on the end. So yeah, so we learned that benzene has a lot of electron density because of all the, the pi bonds and because of its aro aromatic character, it's, it's, it's very stable. And by doing so, or by having this characteristic, you can't really have a typical nucleophilic substitution because the nucleophile will have uh, ele extra electrons and the, the density like uh, charges repel each other. So they can't really get close enough. So we learned about uh, Friedel-Craft uh, alkylation, which uses Lewis acids to basically create a positive charge on the carbon, uh, carbon chain, which then actually makes the uh, benzene a nucleophile and attacks the carbon chain. But the, which it then goes through um, a sigma complex, which is a positive charge, which gets cycled around the benzene ring. And then eventually the hydrogen molecule will get popped or atom will get popped off and you have a little bit of a substitution reaction. But there's a couple limitations on that since, as you can see, if it's set on the primary carbon, then it goes through a hydride shift, creating a secondary carbocation because it's more stable and then which leads to a mix of products, which um, is possible to kind of control which one you get, but a mixture of products is uh, unavoidable. It's gonna have some, some of both. And then also we were taught that, or we were told to treat all the alkylations as if they were in the right conditions, but the right conditions are actually if they're not in the right conditions, then polyalkylation is actually a very common thing because as you add more uh, alkyl chains, it makes it easier and easier to do. So um, yeah, that's not what you want. And then there's also the Friedel-Craft acylation uh, followed by Clemenson reduction, which you could actually add uh, single chain carbons, um, but this also requires two steps and uh, it only uh, gives you a 73% 73, 73 yield. And then there's also, we also learned about withdrawing groups, which you could add a strong withdrawing group like a, a nitro or a halide, which in this case pulls the electron density away from the meta positions and allows a nucleophile to come in. And then it gives a Meisenheimer, Meisenheimer complex, which is a stabilized negative charge around the benzene ring. And then when it arrives back at the um, nucleophilic site, the hydrogen is then removed using usually the, the halide or a, another uh, strong oxygen, which is actually one of the reasons this isn't favorable because you have to add a strong oxygen. And then there's also the sigma adduct, which is basically the same thing as the, the Whalen intermediate sigma complex, but it's with a negative charge. And then as for figure C, that's basically what I was saying earlier. You can't have just a regular nucleophilic attack because the negative charges repel each other. So there's been, there's been interest in organometallic compounds for quite some time. Um, we, we've learned about a couple of them this year um, with an organolithium reagent, uh, organomagnesium, commonly referred to as Grignard reagent, and the lithium diacyl cuprate, also known as the Gilman reagent. But there hasn't been very many calcium uh, versions that were, were uh, properly classified. Sorry, I lost my spot here. Um, so there's very a strong interest in creating these. There's been some uh, noted synthesized calcium analog of Grignard reagents, but none have been properly classified and used. So uh, there's so there's several listed um, organometallic compounds using calcium. Uh, but they, their interaction with methyl groups, uh, one, number one, compound one, sorry, I, I should have a list of these compounds, but um, compound one, it was limited to the reaction with diphenylethylene, which is basically um, an ethylene double bond with two uh, benzene rings at the end. And when, uh, when 
compound one reacted with uh, diphenyl ethene, it created compound four, but this compound when stored in a arene solvent had very little reaction. It was indefinitely stabilized. And there's also two other compounds, two and three, that were had potential to catalyze the hydrogenation of um, basically a, a one butene and one hexene, but they weren't stable after the after the hydrogenation, and they reverted back to the calcium um, calcium the cationic uh, molecule and the um, alkyl benzene or now the oh my god the the enes uh butene butene one and uh one uh hexene so they found out that though that uh, compound one when you remove the thf which um, tetrahydrofuran we've used that a couple times um, if it's if you remove the te tetrahydrofuran, it actually does react well uh, with other uh, compounds like phenylsilane, which is uh, basically a benzene. Oh yeah, this is compound five, which I'm assuming is the THF-free version of one. Um, and then when you mix it with uh, phenylsilane, you get this uh, compound six. So it was reported that when you use a proper amount of phenylsilane with the compound five, it eventually dismutates, the compound six will dismutate and the calcium, one of the calciums and two of the hydrogens actually break off and make calcium hydride and then the bident, bidentate ligand, which is this side of it. Um, but they found that when you use threefold excess phenylsilane, that it does create a stable uh, molecule of six. And it crystallizes readily in toluene, a, a saturated solution of toluene, in a saturated solution in toluene at negative 35 degrees Celsius. And using HNMR, um, they found a signal at 4.27 ppm, which they did assign to the the calcium hydride dimer in the middle. And then they used a uh, X-ray crystal diffraction to confirm that there was a dimer bridge, which is actually one of the, I think I'm pretty sure it is the first calcium, uh, calcium, yeah, uh, organometallic calcium derivative that they've actually been able to crystal characterize. So in, in the past, um, all the calcium sigma alkyls that they have uh, were able to synthesize needed to react with a bulky and kinetically stabilized alkyl chain, um, like a uh, tetra or um, um, uh, tetra-stabilized, I can't think of the word. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, a lot of kinetic stabilization going on there. So, the, um, so they decided to test molecule six with uh, ethene, butene, hexene, and octene. And it was treated with one ATM of these gaseous alkyls. And they found that three, uh, three different, or with the ethene, when it was, uh, when they added the ethene to six, it was very um, non-selective and they seem to have a, another byproduct that, that kept showing up. But then over 48 hours, it did eventually all lead to this. And in, in molecule eight and nine, which is, they, they say it's, it's ethene, but it's basically the, the two chain part is there. So it's actually uh, butane. And then this part is actually hexene, but, um, in eight and nine, they found that it went straight to the product and it, and it was, there was no problem with it. But seven kind of had them wondering what was going on there. And eight and nine were, were successfully x-ray uh, diffraction crystallography to, to classify it as a centro, centrosymmetric dimer, which is what we see here. 
which it's kind of a dimer. It's more, it's, it's, um, there's, it's not a, a covalent bond. It's, it's more of an, a hydrogen attraction and a positive negative charge. So they, yeah. So in order to optimize the production of seven, they, so this was all done in, they, they did this in deuterated benzene, which uh, deuterium, which is, it's the hydrogen molecule or hydrogen atom with a proton, which typically it doesn't have, or I mean, it does have a proton. It doesn't have a neutron. Deuterium has a neutron. So it's, it's a little bit heavier. And all this was done in benzene. So they decided to do the reaction with six and ethene again in a deuterated high, uh, cyclohexane. And they found that it had the same rate of production and same rate of use of the dimer, but it was incredibly more stable. Like the, there, there wasn't the byproduct being made is what was what they were starting to notice. And through distillation of the first reaction, when it happened in benzene, they were able to properly identify it to be D5-ethylbenzene. So they didn't actually even mean to discover this reaction. It was kind of a uh, you know lucky happenstance. And then because they realized that there was this potential. They then did, st they studied eight and nine with uh, D6 benzene, deuterated benzene at, uh, let's see. Oh, I kind of skipped the mechanism. Um, at 60 degrees Celsius over 16 hours resulted in N butyl and N hexyl uh, benzene. So I wanted to just kind of go back. Um, there, so the, the addition of the alkyl groups, the alpha carbon has an attraction to the calcium and the beta carbon gets slightly attracted to the hydrogen. And it's kind of a, uh, I guess by dentate ligand uh, interaction where it's, it's able to interact at both sides. And then it, kind of has a, the, the front gets distracted by the calcium. Meanwhile, the, the second one kind of just gets, you know, it just fits in there on the opposite side of the face that's interacting with the calcium. And they noticed that during monitor, monitorization of the, um, NMR, they notice that there's a four, the increase of a 4.79 ppm signal and a increase of a 2.50, which was increase of, this is the reformation of this dimer using deuterium and the 2.5 signal is the ethyl benzene. And they use 2D NMR to properly uh, characterize these uh, compounds, eight and nine and seven as well. And interestingly enough, yes, so it's basically the same thing happens again. The calcium acts as a, it gives, it has a, a giving nature. Um, of electrons. So when it, that happens, it distracts the benzene uh, electron density, and then it pushes it into the remaining five carbons of the benzene with the, uh, mostly on the para, para prime and, uh, and um, oh, ortho, para and ortho prime positions. And meanwhile, while it's being distracted, the uh, alkyl group is able to come in and perform nucleophilic substitution, which it normally isn't. And then when it creates somewhat of another Meisenheimer complex right here where the negative charge circles around and then when it comes back, it then releases and the hydrogen then gets taken back into the original form that it was in of the calcium hydrido complex. And 
all of this is basically, it, it turns out that the, they use DFT, which is the program that we got to use for a couple of weeks, um, density functional theory. And they use that to basically kind of draw out this whole potential energy surface. And they found that a lot of it has to actually do with the dimerization and redimerization or it, monomer, monomerization and redimerization of the bidentate calcium hydrato complex. And, and basically because of that, there's a reformation of the calcium hydrato complex, which could possibly lead to formation or uh, elaboration to catalysis, which is the reformation of the uh, catalyst. And that's about it. I think I might have messed up there, but I think we're good. Excellent work, Adam. And any questions? Yeah, I had a question. I might have missed it. You might have gone over it already. How do they? How are they preparing these calcium-containing reagents? Like, um, actually, I probably should go back. Um, you mean like the? Oh, no, that's my article. No, that. Am I doing? No, this is the wrong one. Sorry. Are you, are you talking about? Um, the one that they use successfully, like five. Hang on, let me get yeah, my I, PowerPoint back. Get a picture of that. I'm yeah, 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 yeah. Confusing myself now at this question. <laughs> <laughs> no, my bad. No, you're good, man. That was a good presentation. It's an interesting article, Adam. Thanks. Yeah, it's incredible. Honestly, this this has a lot of potential. Although John's is pretty pretty darn good too. Yeah. So, um, were you talking about this one? Because I know that there is, there was a little vagueness. I know because compounds one, two, and three were just well-known calcium hydride complexes, and they don't really say how they synthesized them or what they even really kind of looked like. They just gave the the molecular formula, and then for for five, they I'm in the article they say that they use a NF or not FT, um, THF free, the tetrahydrofuran version of one it has potential to do what they, so like they never say exactly that it is, but I'm assuming that five is that tetrahydrofuran free version of one. And it also says that it was recently noted that this reaction does happen. But then it's supposed to dismutate this this molecule here. It's supposed to dismutate and then just turn into calcium hydride powder, white powder, and just cu it cuts itself in half basically. But when they did it with three, they used excess uh, phenylsilane, and when they did that, they they it gave them a stable uh, compound. So I'm not really sure how exactly they synthesize these. Um, it kind of just happens or they, they yeah so i'm not quite sure uh, did i answer your question or yeah totally man really yeah. really interesting article good job thanks all right so excellent work we've got about technically only 15 minutes left um before we're scheduled to be done for the day and so since i know everybody that I'm tempted to try and just go over and get both of the last two done today. But since I know that people have other things going on, um, uh, as Stephanie or Emily, do either of you um, want to try and present today or would you rather do your presentation at the beginning of class on Thursday? Honestly, I'm gonna say Thursday. <laughs> Because it's a bit long. I mean, my okay. slides are short, but I have additional notes. Yeah, no, no worries. Emily, how about you? Um, I honestly don't care either. Um, my slides are super short, but I have like a ton of like notes and other things on it as well. Um, I could probably do it in, like probably like 15, like 20 minutes, maybe actually no, it's probably gonna be longer than that. So I let's just say wait. Yeah, I think that makes that makes Thursday less awkward too if there's two presentations rather than just one person left to go. Um, so you guys are are uh, in there together. All right, well then we'll we'll end a little bit early today, and uh, we will we'll start at eight on Thursday, 
with a Stephanie or with Emily and then a Stephanie um, presenting your research articles and then we'll go straight from there into a uh, review session. Well, realistically, we'll take a break and then do a review session. Um, all right, any any questions about uh, the rest of this week? John, when's our final going to be available to take? Um, Monday, Monday morning in all likelihood. I have to make sure everything's set up right and proofread it and everything, but I think I've got mostly written. So um, Monday morning, and then you'll just have, you'll have all finals week to, to take it. Um, if there's a pressing need for somebody to take it over the weekend, let me know and I'll see if I can get it done and, and available, you know, Saturday morning in, or instead. Um, but right now the plan is Monday morning. I prefer it, but it's, it's not a pre like pressing need or anything. <laughs> I'll, I'll see what I can do. It's not going to affect the um, the deadline to get it turned in either way. That's going to be Thursday at midnight um, either way. So if I can get it done and ready for you on Saturday, I'll, I'll do I'll uh, try and do that. Um, and I'll have more update for that on uh, on Thursday once I've taken a look at where where I am. All right, well, then great job, everybody who presented today. I'm very, very happy with the uh, level of articles and how well you presented them um, and think back especially to the articles that you, those of you who did articles on um, in fall quarter um, think back to the articles and how you felt about the articles then compared to now and we're doing much much higher level thinking when it comes to OCHEM which we should and um, but in general I'm very very sat happy with uh, with all that so great job and uh, we'll sign off now and I will see everybody on Thursday morning. Hey, Sean. Thanks, Sean. Um, yeah. can, uh, can I actually start work again tomorrow and I'm working Thursday. Um, so I'll be missing the review session. Uh, could you please record the- um, Yes. You present presentations again? Yeah, I'll do that. I'll post the ones we didn't get Cody's um, okay. because I didn't get the get your message until after he had already started and I didn't want to throw him off. Um, so it's everybody but Cody that presented today. I'll post that with our in our lab video slot like normal and then okay. um, the last two presentations on Thursday as well. I'll record those and then the rest of the review session too. Okay, and then um, since I missed, I will essentially be missing uh, Cody's presentation, which really sucks because I it sounds like it was really good. Um, how would you want me to handle that on the grading? So, so just go off of the article, read the article, um, and, and fill it out as best you can that way. Um, and you know, you can, you can always, uh, th throw some, uh, canvas messages to, uh, to Cody, if you have specific questions about the article itself, I'm volunteering you Cody for that. Um, so, or, or send, send me messages if you need anything from me about that. But yeah, um, you can do that, do it entirely from the article if you want. You don't need the presentations for that. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Thank and I'll you. second that, Sean. Feel, feel free to reach out to me, Hava, if you have anything you want to chat about or whatever. Okay, thank you so much, Cody. All right, everybody, have a good evening.